Hello and welcome back in other waters. A huge flat structure bedded into the sea floor. Could we not have buildings? What are we looking at here? There appears to be some kind of shaft cut into the bedrock. I can't see the bottom. Who made this? It looks like it's been here far longer than anything else. A yawning black shaft that descends into the sea floor, an anomaly that must be solved. The suit slams reveal two dark holes on the opposite side of the shaft, their torn edges thick with crimson rust. The bent entryway bulges inwards, like the interior corridor of some so huge creature's distended body. These pale creatures are scraping patterns in the walls. What are they? Let's see what we can find. This almost motionless polyp with its waving cilia is anchored to the metal plating. Its pearl flesh is drained of gold. Sun drifts soften. Sun drifts soften the metal room. On the far wall, strange spirals glint in the headlamps as pale creature obsessively traces their patterns. The compartment is filled with sand and rock which looks to have entered through the collapsed cell. A huge round doorway sealed by a thin metal security iris, the blades of which are furred with orange rust. It's some kind of facility. What was happening down here? Why would someone bury this place so deep? We have to get inside. It's sealed tight. We need to find a tool to cut through the security iris. Well, we don't have anything to cut it with. No. Let's go back. If we found more of those clips, we can use them. We need one more. Or maybe we have something in your ship. The slope continues its irresistible descent toward the distant and disappointing. The veils thin out, the last of the light flowing across the sandy slope as it descends into deeper water. Dangles behind us, leaving only the dark of the deep ocean behind. The 
This gap between tangles will pass it further down the slope. I'm not clearing the field surrounded by possible routes both through and past the different veils. Bodies of creatures that were trapped in the veils lie proud in the silk. The veils must pass them here in the time to go. Lead to another gap in the tangle field of light. Here, the wolf of veils coming close to me, away from the core of the tangle at strange angles. The veils on each side are mimicking each other, both in shape and pattern, pulsing lights, pulling and moving. A large puzzled door sits on the shelf, its dark skin textured by the light of the nearby tangle. But the far side of the veiled fields, this outlook sits silently dubbed with violent pockets of light. At the tip of the shelf, fed by soft current, these creatures pump moving water around the outlook. Is this way the veils still live? Split away from another here, moving down the slope away from the pool. A shell segment gleams on a large number of semi dangerous husks, damped by the veil that looks more like the sample. As tangles split away from each other, the density of the field starts to be low. of territory yet to be claimed by the strange patterns of the veil field. Two veils that look they have recently split present a wide gap in this place. Here the veils part looking back towards the fellow candles. I'm starting to think there's some battle of full territory between the veils as they search for the best spot to cast their nets. Let's quit and let's call the drone. I was hoping we'd find something to cut. So many knife like in the Hey, you're online again. I've been trying to sleep, but I can't stop thinking about that impossible shaft, that anomaly. What is it doing here? Below thousands of meters deep and leading it ever deeper into the bedrock. There's something wrong about it. There's history here that has been forgotten. We need to get inside. Maybe we can find another way. Out by the out other ROV. Could it have uncovered something equally strange? Only one way to find out, mustn't wait any longer. I doubt it I will be sleeping again before the thing is done. Thank you. 
so much to read. Black crests resemble large crabs and their basic anatomy, though they are instantly recognizable by the large multi-chambered bubbles they carry on their backs. The function of these bubbles is unclear, but each individual produces slightly different bubble forms, and individuals who have also been observed with their bubbles at different levels of inflation. They seem to be filled with gas, but without analyzing them directly, we cannot know which gas is. To feed, land crests use their complex mouth parts to chew up silt and rock, slowly and systematically walking through their territory. These territories seem to be unique to each creature, and I have yet to see one land mistress passing on another individual's garden. A direct sample of the mucus bubble might help us understand more about their behavior. After finding a shed land crest bubble, it has been possible to analyze its contents. The majority of the bubble is filled with oxygen. It seems that in its processing of minerals and compounds found in the silt and the rock of the ocean floor, landcrests are able to produce and process these gases, perhaps with the help of bacterial symbionts living inside their bodies. But what are they producing these bubbles for? It could be that they are defensive structures, able to be shed and popped when the relatively slow moving and vulnerable landcrests need to escape. But then why the carefully managed cocktail of gases? Further investigation is needed. In particular, we should look to inspect a land crest shell. These tall font shaped filter videos can be found in the deep ocean of glass 67 cc with a glow of a distinctive warm bioluminescence. The centerpieces of the deep ocean's oasis of life hold fire fans and their flame like pulsing light attract many other creatures to live around them. How this benefits the fan isn't precisely clear. But there are many possibilities, including defense and assistance. assistance. Although the fans themselves do not lag in defenses, as unlike the smaller and paler fans which can be found in bloom, cold fire fans have a shedable mucus sheath which stops them becoming overgrown with other plants and creatures. Sampling and analyzing these sheets may give some further insight into the role they play in the fans' eating habits. Getting hold of a cold fire fan's sheath has brought many other samples with it. The sheath itself was covered in bone microbiological colonies in fecal matter. It seems that the sheath acts as a barrier for large particles, blocking them from reaching the fan's spines, while small particles pass through and are di digested by the fan. The fan's light is then a beacon specifically intended to bring creatures into its glow, benefiting the fan with the resulting increase in particles in the local area. The sheath stops this from becoming overwhelming for the fan and can be shed in order to protect it. The patterns of the fan's light remain mysterious though. Why does each individual display different pulses and waves at different times? These shelled creatures with their large translucent tails are surprisingly fast for animals of their kind. Occasionally spotted weaving between the veils in the deep, they use this this speed as a way of evading in the slow-moving ta tangles. They are also dark in color and small, making them a difficult target for other creatures that may hunt them. They use modified back legs with wide oil-like shapes to both propel themselves and make rapid turns. But most distinctive of all their features is the large translucent tail which stands like a crest behind them. From my observation, these tails seem to be a form of propulsion for the sea sail shells. But until I can inspect a fragment of one in more detail, this cannot be confirmed. After finding a segment from a sail shell's tail, it seems obvious that these that these creatures use their tail for propulsion. But rather than flapping them like a flipper, the sail shells use their tails to catch currents and allow the flow of water propel them through the deep ocean. Their tails and the rest of their shells are incredibly light which means that even a mild flow is enough to grant them significant speed. This may also be why they follow the same paths. Their propulsion is best suited to using currents where they can find them, rather than choosing their own world. But why travel back and forth through dangerous veil territory over and over? Perhaps a look at a full sail shell in the alarm one to help us understand this. 
After analyzing a clutch of beaded cell shell eggs and inspecting their anatomy, I started to understand their behavior. Larval cell shells are already forming modified limbs with thin, thread-like twists on them. These limbs move so fast when the cell shell is swimming that they can be seen, but in the dormant eggs they are clearly visible. These whisks cut all the cell shells to feed on by catching small larvae creatures as well as any other particles of nutrients found in the water. This must be what the cell shells are doing when they follow their carefully selected paths back and forth through the water. It is also likely that the whales attract, trap and produce tiny particles that cell shells feed on, hence their close proximity. The result of the cell shells is a very risky feeling pattern. A dying whale analysis of the tissue demonstrates what a unique creature a snare whale is. Its tissue is threaded through with powerful neural connections, lying with a digestive surface like the interior of an animal intestine, and coated with a layer of light emitting cells. It is as if a single creature had been turned inside out and rolled out until it was a flat plane, millimeters thick. A snare whale is a totally uh, is a totally distributed form of life, with no centralized brain, stomach or other organs at all. It is self-same in its entirety, and other piece resembles another. What we saw was a dying veil, may have been purposefully spreading itself, as each piece of veil could grow another tangle. No wonder they have dominated portions of a circle. Oreos are complex masses of polyps, tentacles and other structures that form a web-like structure that swims as one. Unlike a terrestrial jellyfish, oreos appear to be asymmetrical with marked differences between individuals. Many of their orbiting sections are thin, blade-like membranes, but structures that resemble strings of translucent pearls, thread-like tentacles and bulbous polyps also make up a large part of their bodies. Each orrery has a central mass, which is protected by a series of cloud-like soft membranes, twisted around each other like a rose. Close encounters with orrery have shown them to be dangerous hunters, capable of tangling up and shocking their prey into submission. They also deploy shocks as a defensive measure when faced with larger creatures, like me. Perhaps further study of their prey may help. Having analyzed some tissue from the orrery's other prey, we can begin to understand their behavior. Unable to match other creatures for speed, orries seem to rely on the dangers presented by deep sea whales, beside which they are often found. Whales funnel cautious creatures into the orrery's nets, while the orries themselves don't seem to be affected by the whales and are able to traverse them easily. Perhaps the two have a symbiotic relationship, hunting together in a mutually beneficial manner. Outside of this, orries appear to be mostly lone hunters, and I have seen no social interactions between individuals. But what exactly is an orrery? I would like to understand more about the strange, uneven forms, perhaps a polyp that have been shed by proof details on their anatomy. Analysis of an orrery polyp has demonstrated that they are indeed colonial creatures. They appear to be made up of both specialized animals of the same species, and different creatures of different species. Based on this, the orrees may need to be reclassified, although that would require extensive study and equipment I don't have access to. What I can say about the orrees is that they one seem they, they, that each one seems to have specialized its own growth based on its requirements. Many of the zoids that are part of the colony are able to shift between metazoid, dactylozoid, tentaculozoids, and gastrozoid with incredible speed depending on whether the colony needs to focus on proportion, feeding, defense, or digestion. This makes each ore a complex social and biological structure, like a floating city rather than a lone hunter. Water bulbs are pale, soft, egg-shaped creatures with transparent sections in their outer, outer membrane. Water bulbs filter water through their interiors, which are hollow apart from a single gelatinous sphere which sits at their center. Their anatomy is so unique that it is difficult to understand exactly what these incredibly passive creatures are doing. They seem to have small, stump-like legs at their base for stability, but it is unclear if they can use them to move. Water buds seem to simply sit and filter water. 
while bathing in the pale light at the edge of the calm oasis. Perhaps we could understand more by analyzing the petal pollen and water particles they seem to absorb when filtering the oasis's water. The analysis of petal pollen, which reveals them to be water bubbles with a skin of waste matter, fails to add much more to our understanding of the water bulb. It's clear that they gain nutrients and perhaps some of the oxygen housed in their interior from their consumption of the pollen, but unlike the glowing fans, they don't seem to be reliant on it. Instead, they display a surprising level of passivity while absorbing and filtering much of their local environment. They seem to be without predators or prey and are ignored by many other life forms. I have noticed that some specimens have buds, small growths which suggest that they are grown clones of themselves to reproduce. Perhaps by carefully sampling one of these buds, we might get a miniature picture of what bulb water bulbs anatomy. Analyzing a water bulb bud has provided an important insight into their anatomy. The bulbs themselves are mostly hollow, with only a thin membrane filled with pores separating them and the water around. The interior side of this membrane is iridescent, lined with hexagonal crystals of guanine, producing an effect like the eye shine seen in the terrestrial cats, sh sharks and other creatures, but on a much larger scale. These crystals reflect light onto the sphere at the center of the bulb, which is in fact a huge and impossibly complex compound eye. This eye can see a broad spectrum of light, including UV and IR, with at least 36 different photoreceptors types. What are these water bulbs observing, and why, when they are so passive, just the fault of their total vision makes them nervous in the process? Free by the first appeal of fixed stock trifle plants found in the deep of the 667 cc ocean. The only known specimens currently identified have all been found gathered around glowing plants, basking in a warm light. This suggests that the bathers are photosynthesizing this bioluminescence in order to live and therefore cannot live outside of the sustaining glow of the fans. This has a knock-on effect for other life, as grouping of bathers then attract other creatures perhaps to feed on or hide within them. The bathers also seem to produce a type of pollen, made up of small particles that float on the deep water currents. This may well be a seasonal or rare event that my visit has happened to coincide with, or a constant state. A further study of this pollen would be desirable. Analysis of bitter pollen has shown that they are released around bubble of oxygen, a waste product of the plant's photosynthesis. These bubbles are surrounded with a layer of pollen particles, which weighs them down so that they do not immediately rise to the surface. Instead, these bubbles drift through the water near the bather, and in many cases settle on the nearby fan. The fans then consume these bubbles, absorbing both the oxygen and pollen along with anything else which reaches them. This direct exchange of energy and nutrients make the fans of the bathers closely linked, a strong bond formed under the principle of mutual gain. And that's going to be the end for today, because my throat is killing me. So for now, thank you very much, stay alive, and see you soon. Bye!